Hi everyone, welcome to another SEGI Evening School of Webinar session brought to you by SEGI Group of Colleges. My name is Afni and I am going to be the moderator for today's session. Welcome to this live webinar entitled How Not to Get Conned by Fake News brought to you by SEGI Group of Colleges. All right, before we begin, I'd like to do a quick tech checkup. Can everyone hear and see me clearly? Type yes if you can. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, are you ready? For those of you who have just joined in, I welcome you once again to this live webinar entitled How Not to Get Conned by Fake News. My name is Afni and I will be your host for today. A quick briefing to everyone before we start. Our session today should take approximately 60 minutes. During the session, we encourage you to type your questions in the comment sections below and our speaker will try to answer your questions in the comment section. Uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. We would also like to inform everyone that this, this webinar is recorded and will be used by SEGI University and Colleges and its subsidiaries in the future. Before we proceed, can everyone type in the comment section and share with us where are you connecting from? As I understand, there are registrations from all over Malaysia and other countries. All right. So everyone ready? If you're ready, press one. Okay, so our topic for today is how not to get conned by fake news. And our, and our speaker for today is Professor Stephen E. Stewart. Okay, Professor Stephen E. Stewart, Steve, is a former newspaper reporter and editor in the United States. He retired in 2019 after 10 years as an assistant professor of journalism at Troy University in Alabama. He taught interviewing, reporting, news writing, opinion writing, editing, design, and media law, including two courses in SEGI's American degree program and one course at Yunnan Normal University in China. He earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's from the University of Alabama, both in journalism. All right, I believe everyone is ready. So without further ado, I would like to, I would like to inv invite uh, Steve. So over to you, Steve. Hi. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to spend some more time with people from SEGI. I really enjoyed my two visits to Malaysia and the students and faculty, including AFNI, whom I worked with. And I appreciate the opportunity to join you for this webinar. I'm in Alabama in the southeastern United States right now. It's about 730 in the morning. Uh, we're undergoing the epidemic uh, coronavirus, just like you are. We've had a little bit of a surge locally in cases just this past week or so. So we're still very much in the middle of those coronavirus problems. We're trying to stay, I'm trying to stay out of circulation. A lot of people are and to uh, wear a mask when I'm near people. So I um, hope you, you guys stay healthy. We're certainly trying to do that here. Please bear in mind that I've spent a total of four weeks in Malaysia during my entire life and I have limited familiarity with Malaysia. Most of what I'm saying here is from a U.S. perspective. I would certainly welcome your questions and comments to help me relate more closely to Malaysia. And Afni, please give us the next slide. I want to start with a confession. <clears throat> I myself have been guilty of putting bad information on the Internet, and I did it at least once in an effort to urge people not to believe false information. I'm referring to this comment that I posted on Facebook two years ago. It says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. I attributed it to Mark Twain, who's an American writer and humorist whose best known fictional characters were probably Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. 
Unfortunately, I did not check out the authenticity of the quote before I posted it. <clears throat> I still believe it's an opinion worthy of Mark Twain, but and I agree with the sentiment he expressed, but uh, uh, it, I'm not sure Mark Twain's the one who said it. Now, as for what he said, I think it's right. Uh, for example, if I tried to drive a car in Malaysia, I might assume that I should drive on the right-hand side of the road because that's what we do in the United States. But driving on the right side of the road in Malaysia could quickly get me or someone else killed. Last summer, an American diplomat's wife was reportedly driving on the wrong side of the road in England, meaning the right side, the right-hand side, and she collided head-on with a 19-year-old man and who was riding a motorcycle, and he was killed. It's possible that Mark Twain actually made this statement because we don't have a record of everything any individual says, but there's no evidence that he said it, so I should not have attributed the quote to him. Next. <clears throat> At some point after making that erroneous Facebook post, I came across information that led me to suspect that I was wrong. So I did what I should have done at the beginning. I did some research. And, it, and one piece of evidence that I found was this article from the New Republic magazine. It says that Mark Twain never wrote it or said anything like it. But at least I was spreading demonstrably good advice. Next. So I repeat what Mark, what somebody said, not necessarily Mark Twain. It ain't what you know, don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure. It just ain't so. And these are some of the ways that be, believing something that's not true will get you and other people into trouble. <coughs> that last one is especially important today. During recent years, the United States has experienced divisiveness and chaos. Now, you expect a little of those things in a free society, but the division and chaos have been especially intensified by the fact that our people can no longer agree on a common set of facts. Many of us don't know what's true or how to figure out what's true. And you can place a lot of the blame on fake news. Next. Fake news is a useful term that got hijacked by some, some politicians in the sense that they apply it too loosely as well as inaccurately. They label any news that makes them look bad as fake news. But let's go with the definition that my online dictionary uses. It says fake news is false information that is broadcast or published as news for fraudulent or politically motivated purposes. Fake news is misinformation with an M, meaning information that is incorrect. If somebody's intentionally sharing the information in order to achieve a purpose, then you could say, you could call it disinformation with a D. Next. <clears throat> now you might say, why do we have bad information that masquerades as news? Well, in my experience, the most common explanation for something going wrong is that somebody made a mistake. Maybe they were careless or distracted. They should not have, they should have been more careful, but they, we're not really trying to deceive us, and we should never overlook the simplest possible explanation for something, and that's that. That's it, that some people make mistakes. They're not trying to con you. I suppose some people create fake news for fun just to see what they can get away with. More people do it to support causes they believe in. But much fake news is generated because people want money and power. Politicians want to influence you. Business people want to make money off you. We've had a lot of discussion in the United States about efforts by Russia to influence our presidential elections. And a key Russian tactic has been to foment fake news that's designed to help or hurt candidates or simply to stir up animosity among Americans. So that's an example of fake news motivated by a lust for power. NPR, which is National Public Radio in the United States, tracked down and interviewed a man he ran a company that was generating fake news. He said his purpose was to expose the fake news business by publishing fake stories, letting people react to them, and then showing people how they had been deceived. But he was also making money off advertising on his site. Regarding a particular story, this is what he said. The people wanted to hear this, so all it took was to write that story, 
Everything about it was fictional. The town, the people, the sheriff, the FBI guy, close quote. And then he said his social media guys dropped it into certain online groups and forums. And he said that the story spread like wildfire. Emotion ties into the profit or power motive, but not necessarily on the part of the perpetrator. The emotions of the audience are what makes fake news so powerful. NPR's advice for the consumer is, if it makes your blood boil, check it. We have a pertinent quote here from H.L. Mencken, a prominent American newspaper editor who died long before the internet was a thing. But his comment explains a lot about why we have fake news. He said, no one in this world, so far as I know, has, has ever lost money by underestimating the intelligence of the great masses of the plain people. Next. This meme a riot appeared on Facebook recently in connection with the coronavirus, COVID-19. I suppose it did not do a lot of damage, but it was factually wrong. It gave a false account of how COVID-19 got its name. Now, how do I know this information is false? Well, usually when I'm skeptical of, some, of information, I just Google it. In this case, I Googled some of the key words of the statement, such as COVID stands for Chinese Originated Viral Infectious Disease. Within seconds, I had my answer. Next. One thing I found was a fact-checking article on the website called Snopes.com, S-N-O-P-E-S. -E Snopes says the statement is false. You don't see the explanation here, but Snopes published an article of several hundred words in length that showed it was false. It turns out that, as you see here, in COVID-19, CO stands for corona, VI for virus, and D for disease. 19 is the year, 2019. Next. Another source that I found was a website of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. CDC explained that the World Health Organization named the disease and repeated whose explanation of the name. An even better source would have been the World Health Organization itself. I looked uh, for such an explanation on whose website, but I did not find it immediately. I did not keep looking because I thought I had already obtained enough authoritative information. And by that, by authoritative, I mean information that is from authoritative, believable, and credible sources. Next. Some fake news is more harmful than others because it actually can lead you to do something that would be bad for you. Bad medical advice, for example. In the United States, top scientists at first did not advise everyone to wear a face mask. Over a period of weeks, the advice shifted as they got more information. The best advice now seems to be that a face mask provides less protection for the wearer than for other people with whom that person comes into contact. In other words, we should wear a mask to keep ourselves from spreading the virus to other people. Some of my friends on Facebook are still spreading the old advice, even though most scientific opinion has shifted. I know it's frustrating when people change their advice, but we should try to go by the most recent Best information available. Next. Some publications get the reputation of being liberal or conservative because of the opinions that are expressed on their sites or in their pages. But one tradition of good journalism is that a writer should keep his or her opinions out of a news story. A news story should be factual, and if the facts are fairly presented, the writer's opinions should not matter. Mainstream journalists don't put their opinions in news stories, but sometimes the same publications also contain clearly labeled opinion articles. I like the tr tradition that many newspapers used to follow of having a figurative wall of separation between newsroom and opinion staffs. But sometimes opinions aren't labeled as opinions and you have to figure it out for yourself. Let's look at some examples of facts, opinions, and combinations of the two. Next. <clears throat> this statement is a provable or disprovable fact. This event either happened or it did not. If there's no evidence that it happened, nobody should be saying it happened because they 
because it didn't, but they might say that. Hopefully you can find evidence for or against this allegation. In fact, the headline appears to be substantially true. Google helped me find a news release dated May 20 from the U.S. Department of Justice. It details the charges against this one particular election official in Philadelphia who's named in the news release and who pleaded guilty. It would have to do further, I would have to do further research to determine whether the word officials should be plural. In other words, whether more than one election official was paid. The, mem the meme contains attribution to Reuters, which is a reputable news service, so that's another reason to believe it. You could check with Reuters to be sure that's what they reported. Next. This one is mostly an opinion because we can't get inside another person's heads. We can only guess what other people are actually thinking. But it also contains an implied factual assertion that this drug called hydroxychloroquine is safe. Its safety is still in dispute, as I understand it. So if I were you, I would check it out further and perhaps get a doctor's advice before using this drug. Next. <clears throat> This is someone's opinion, although some people may find it distasteful or inconsiderate of people who don't have similar beliefs. But you could say that the argument here is spurious because the part of the Bible, the part about the Bible is inconsistent with part of the Constitution, with the part that says, mentions the Constitution. The U.S. Constitution forbids having an official religion. To require that everyone take the oath of office on a Bible would arguably be a violation the First Amendment to the Constitution, which says in part, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Next. Unlike previous generations, we now have access to an unlimited store of information on the Internet. But a lot of it is bad information. Those of us who want to be well informed and make good decisions need to be shrewd and know what to believe. We need to know how to separate good information from bad. Next. The Internet allows us to filter our sources of information if we wish. No longer do we have to page through a newspaper or listen to a news broadcast that exposes us to information on a variety of subjects from many different points of view. But we need to be aware of confirmation bias, which basically means wishful thinking. When we come across information that tends to support our pre-existing opinions, we should be careful about automatically embracing that information until we check it, check it out. And we should put ourselves, we should not put ourselves in an information bubble that excludes in inconvenient facts and contrary points of view. Ignoring facts that you don't like may be the path of least resistance, but it is not very smart because we need all the relevant information available in order to make good decisions. Nonetheless, confirmation bias explains why fake news works on so many people. If it tells them what they want to hear, they will embrace it. Next. <clears throat> I remember when we did not have the internet and then when we did, the question soon came up. Why do we need journalists when everybody can publish on the internet? As the amount of information on the internet grew, it became obvious that much of that information that anyone would ever need could be found already on the internet. And that gave us even more reason to question why we need journalists. Well, it turned out that the internet wasn't the perfect source of information. For one thing, good information can't get on the internet until somebody goes to the trouble to obtain that information and publish it. The information doesn't just pop up on websites magically. Also, there's so much information online that somebody needs to organize it, prioritize it, and explain it so that readers can efficiently retrieve what they really need and want to know. But the most alarming reality that we encountered is that there's a lot of false information out there. People actually do make stuff up. So readers need to be alert and know how to recognize bad information so that they won't rely on it. And they need some help in that regard from, guess who? Journalists. Next. <clears throat> it's not very smart to give absolute power to any individual or institution. 
Our society works best when there are checks and balances, when the power is dispersed among several groups that watch one another and sometimes compete with each other. Journalists get accused of lying all the time, but have you ever noticed that politicians lie too? For politicians, the desire to obtain and maintain power sometimes leads them to do things that are not in the public interest, even if they were elected by the people. So in a free society, it's helpful to have the news media in place to serve as watchdogs and sound the alarm when something bad is going on. Of course, nobody likes to be accused of lying or of being incompetent or doing something wrong. And public officials do need do things that they really don't want people to know about. So when the press writes about such things, sometimes the politicians accuse the press of publishing fake news. The best journalists are the ones who find the truth and tell it. Next. Investigative journalism, in a broad sense, is most journalism. It's when reporters go out and investigate a story and get the facts. That definition applies to almost all news stories. But when we say investigative journalism, we're usually referring to something that goes deeper. Investigative journalism is not simply repeating information that the government has released. Investigative journalism means digging up details, usually details that someone would like to hide. UNESCO recognizes the value of investigative journalism. Investigative journalists often expose situations that need correcting, and in that way, they help set the agenda for action by the government. Next. <clears throat> I'm going to start now with a list of questions that you can ask to help determine whether a story is true. If you can't find satisfactory answers to most of these questions, you have, to reason, you have no reason to believe that the story is true or to share it with other people. On the first point, good journalism is fair. There are not just two sides to most stories. There are more than two. And a good reporter will seek information and opinions from people of all significant points of view, as well as looking at the evidence available on all sides. You'll know the reporter did this because the information and sources will be spelled out in the story. And if an essential source was not available, the reporter will tell you that he tried to contact that source. That's why so often you see in stories that so-and-so could not be reached for comment. On the second point, just saying that he said this and she said that is not enough. The reporter should look for evidence to corroborate or disprove what people said. Next. A lot of journalists say they don't like math, but you have to know a little math in order to evaluate the numbers that people throw at you. Here's a simple example. This internet meme claimed that members of the U.S. House of Representatives raised their own salaries by $25 million in a coronavirus relief bill. There are 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate. That's 535 members of Congress. So I used this calculator built into my Mac to divide, to divide 25 million by 535. And the calculation is accurate. It's $46,728.97 per member of Congress. So the math checks out. But what about the assertion that they actually did this? Is it true? Next. No, it's not true. I found that the newspaper USA Today had done a fact check on this claim. And they found that $25 million was to cover the cost of Congress members and the staffs working working remotely and dealing with the coronavirus emergency, including the work of the sergeant at arms, video equipment, laptops, other computers, and customer support. It was not for congressional salaries. Next. You've heard the theory that the earth is flat, but we discount that because today we know it's ridiculous. People travel around the world and we actually have photographs from space of the earth as a globe. But would it surprise you to know that the Flat Earth Society still exists and has its own website? It's tfes.org in case you want to go there. That's tfes for the Flat Earth Society. The society, this society describes itself as a place for free thinkers and the intellectual exchange of ideas. Its website is dedicated to unraveling the true mysteries of the universe and demonstrating that the earth is flat 
and that round earth doctrine is little more than an elaborate hoax. The existence of this website is a reminder that just because something is published on the internet, that doesn't mean it's true. You have to look for authoritative information and be aware that anyone can say anything on the internet. Next. Sometimes if you look closely at an item, you can tell not to believe it. This headline was timely and halfway plausible when it was published a few days after President Trump took office. But the giveaway that it's fake news is the byline on the story. Next. Do we have any fans of Breaking Bad in our audience? I'm a fan of Breaking Bad. It's a TV series about Walter White, who was a high school, a fictional high school chemistry teacher who becomes an accomplished methamphetamine cook and gets deep into the illegal drug trade between the United States and Mexico. The article is supposedly written by Walter White. Well, I'm sure there are many people named Walter White, but in this case, the website gave, gave us his picture, and it happens to be a picture of the actor Brian Cranston in his TV role as Walter White, the meth cook. The same picture that I found with a Google search, which you see here. This Walter White is not a real person, so he could not have written this article, and there's no reason to believe any of the information in the article. If they lie to you about one thing, they'll lie to you about other things. Next. A reporter should be telling you where he or she got the information. He should be naming names of most of his sources, and they should be real people who are authoritative sources for the information they provided. If you wanted to check out his story by interviewing the sources yourself, he should be giving you a roadmap to do that. If he's quoting other news media or other secondhand sources, there's more chance that this story contains errors. You should want to go directly to the other news media mentioned and find out firsthand what they said. In other words, if USA Today says its information came from the New York Times, then go to the New York Times to check it out and get more details. Sometimes a reporter cannot obtain all the information she wants. If there are holes in the, holes in the story, H-O-L-E-S, the reporter should readily admit it and explain how she tried to fill those holes. It's the same, it's the same approach taken by good academic researchers. A research paper might say, Here's a study that we did, here's what we learned, and here's what we still don't know that could be a subject to further research. Next. <clears throat> Reporters obtain their information from at least three kinds of sources. People, who could be newsmakers, or people who are affected by the story, experts, authorities, also from documents, and. Uh, these documents provide details that help to corroborate information. They also provide very strong evidence that you're quoting reliable sources. And then from observation, from being there and seeing it happen, that's where real news comes from. Our a reporter gets the news. Next. In other words, we might say you should get your news Reporters should get their news from the horse's mouth. Sometimes when a person says something surprising or hard to believe, another person will ask, where did you get that? And the response may be, I got it from the horse's mouth. That's a figure of speech, meaning that the information came straight from someone who knows it firsthand or from a document that can serve as direct evidence. As much as possible, reporters should obtain their information from the horse's mouth. In academia, researchers might say, to use primary sources as opposed to secondary sources that are just repeating information that they found elsewhere. I cannot overemphasize the importance of knowing sources and evidence. If you don't take away anything else from this presentation, remember this, always look for the evidence. And it follows that if you don't know the sources and evidence for information, you have no reason to believe it. Next. <clears throat> sometimes knowledgeable people will not speak to reporters unless their names are withheld. In such a case, the reporter has to decide whether the information is valuable enough to use while keeping the source anonymous. A story that's built entirely on anonymous sources is asking you as a reader to make 
an incredible leap of faith. You should exercise great skepticism. When you see an anonymous source cited in the story, you should ask yourself, how do I know I can trust this information? The answer depends in part on whether you trust the reporter and the news organization and whether other evidence corroborates what the anonymous source said. Next. <clears throat> Vague statements and generalities don't deserve to be believed unless they are backed up by details. And you should ask yourself whether the details actually support the thesis of the article. Are they subject to some other interpretation that casts doubt on the conclusions drawn? If it's an important story, you can bet that more than one news organization will be covering it. So you should look to see whether they do and whether their reports are consistent. You can also consult one or more of the many websites that are devoted to checking the facts of stories people tell about current events. Next. <clears throat> News is based on facts, and so is academic and scientific research. One difference is that news is often anecdotal. Anecdotal means it's a true account of one incident, but it's not necessarily proof that things happen that way all the time or most of the time. To establish that they do, you need research, studies that employ scientific methods. But in news writing, you do identify your sources much as you do in research. And in news writing, you don't use footnotes. You use, you use attribution. He said, she said, and so on, according to things like that. Look for the sources in a news story. Next. When I saw this story on Facebook, I was skeptical just because it was news to me. I had not seen it elsewhere. And I was not familiar with the website that published it, which is called newbbcs.blogstock blogspot.com. This could easily have been a site set up by an individual or organization seeking to influence opinion rather than report the news. So I checked out the story by Googling the key phrases in the headline. Next. To my surprise, the story turned out to be true. I found these details on the website of the U.S. Department of Justice, the government agency that had brought the charges. Other corroborating evidence was available on the web, too. It's a good thing I checked it out. I learned some. Next. <clears throat> this is one of the fact-checking websites that I mentioned. When a story gets into circulation, PolitiFact checks the facts and writes an article about it, giving a score as to how true it is. You could say that PolitiFact reverse engineers the story, duplicating much of the reporting process that should have gone into developing the story before it was published. The resulting rating will be true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, or pants on fire. False means the statement is not accurate. Pants on fire means the statement is not accurate and ridiculous. I love that description of ridiculous news. Children in the U.S. use it when they say, when they catch other children in a lie, they'll say, liar, liar, pants on fire. So you can see some of the stories that they reviewed and what they found about each one. For example, some people may have been hoping that they could have an excuse for smoking marijuana, thinking that it would stop coronavirus, but that turns out to be mostly false. Next. <clears throat> when Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, was filmed delivering personal protective equipment, such as face masks, to a nursing home, Pence made a joke about some empty boxes. This gave rise to reports on the internet that he was just trying to look good while delivering boxes that actually were empty. PolitiFact checked it out. The main thing it did was to look at the full-length video of Pence's expedition. It turned out that the allegation against Mike Pence was not true. So Politica, PolitiFact labeled it false, but not Pence on fire. Jimmy Kimmel, a comedian who hosts a late night TV show, had fallen for the false version of the story. Kimmel wound up apologizing in a tweet, which you see at the lower right here. Kimmel still called it a staged publicity stunt, which was his opinion and may have been true. Next. These are some of the fact checking sites that are available. It does not hurt to check two or three of them when trying to determine the truth of a particular story. 
you can go to your most trusted fact checking site or just Google the keywords in the headline. If there has been a fact check, it will often show up among the first few results of your Google search. Next. Social media sites such as Facebook provide you with some clues and tools that you can use to tell whether something is fake news. If you encounter a broken link or a message that content is not available, that could mean that either Facebook or the publisher took it down because of truth issues. Highlighted on the right here, you'll see an I in a circle. You can click on it to get information about the site that's a news, that, the, that a news item comes from. You'll see the pop-up information here. In this case, uh, the site was the New York Post. So Facebook told us about the New York Post. Next. Twitter does fact checks, and recently it started fact checking the President of the United States, who's a prolific tweeter. This is a post that the President made about mail in voting. Twitter's fact checkers decided that he had made an unsubstantiated claim about mail voting and fraud, so Twitter provided a link to additional information. President Trump did not like being fact checked, and pretty soon, he signed an executive order that could result in Twitter and other social media losing some of the protections that they have from federal government interference in their operations. Or maybe not. Some of the things he wants that President Trump wants might require acts of Congress or amendments to the Constitution. Changing the Constitution is especially difficult to achieve. Next. <clears throat> the first thing I want to say here is that you should always look at the date a story was posted. If it's too old, it may no longer be relevant. It may have been superseded by more recent events. I used the example earlier of the advice experts give about wearing face masks. Information stays on the internet for a very long time, and if you're not careful, you'll read an old story and think it's current. If the story doesn't have a date, that's one reason not to believe it or to rely on it. Timeliness of one of the news phases that journalists use to decide what to cover and how to cover it. That's not to say that old events cannot be newsworthy. For example, current events may provide a time peg to review the history of similar events. Next. Now, regarding the previous slide, I just wanted to say that if an old story is published for no apparent good reason, it may be intended more to influence you than to inform you. The other question that... Uh, <coughs> we mentioned they relate to the type of site that the news is published on. <coughs> Excuse me. If the site does not have a good reputation, or if you don't know its reputation, you should be skeptical. Now, social media are not news media. A study, shown by, a study done by the Pew Research Center shows that 62% of U.S. adults get news from social media. That doesn't mean they get all their news from social media, and they certainly should not. But if you rely on social media for news, you won't learn everything that you need to know. And you may get a skewed version of the events because people who so post on social media uh, are posting what they're interested in, not necessarily what's important. It's not necessarily balanced. The truth is that making sure you get the truth and learn what you need to know requires some work on your part. Social media can be helpful to point you to interesting or relevant news, but social media are not enough. Go beyond what Facebook says and look at Facebook sources. Also, browse several news media that have different points of view and subject matter expertise. Next. <clears throat> this guy's sarcastic tweet suggests that he's been getting a lot of advice about COVID-19 from friends who think they know more than the experts. Perhaps these friends engaged with him on Facebook, but he seems to feel that real experts are better sources than people who just have uninformed opinions. I think he's right. Next. Sometimes people think that the news media select stories that will advance a particular point of view and that they purposely avoid reporting on stories on the other side. In reality, good journalists base news decisions on criteria like these. This is what we call the tip cup list, 
when teaching journalism at Troy University. Uh, you can't actually see all of them here. I'll, I'll tell you what they are. Timeliness, impact, proximity, conflict, unusualness, and prominence. Timeliness means, did it happen recently? Impact means, how many people does it affect? And how strongly does it affect them? Proximity means how close is it to people, either physically or emotionally. Conflict means uh, uh, what are the uh, conflicting ideas here and, and uh, circumstances and people that uh, make the story relevant and interesting. Unusualness is novelty. How often does it happen? Prominence is a prominent person involved. Those are all news criteria. The more of these criteria a story meets for a news organization's audience or readers, the more newsworthy it is and the more prominence and attention it gets. And do you want to know why some stories don't get covered? Sometimes it's because the media don't have the personnel or resources to cover them. And often it's because they simply didn't know about these stories because nobody told them. More than once when working as a journalist, I was accused of bias for not covering stories or not including facts that I simply had not known about. Next. There's a school of thought in the U.S. that President Trump gets too much time and space from the media and that they should just ignore him. If he did that, if they did that, they would allow him uh, not, they would not allow him to, to manipulate the media as much. He would be deprived of free publicity and his message, whether it's true or false, would not be spread around. But not covering the president of the United States is not really an option for legitimate news media. He's arguably the most prominent person in the world and perhaps the most influential. Whatever he does or says is news, whether you like it or not. Covering what he says does not mean that you agree with him. Instead of ignoring Mr. Trump, the good news media check out what he says, report the facts they believe to be true, and report on what critics say about him. Next. Now, it would be foolish for me to argue that any news organization is totally neutral, that it doesn't have a perspective that influences the way it covers and frames the news. Good journalists try to be objective, in other words, to base their coverage on provable facts, and they try to be fair. But every journalist's life experience and personal beliefs influence the way he selects and reports the news. It's human nature, it's unavoidable, and it's true for news organizations as well as individual journalists. Media bias. Media Bias Fact Check is a site that I learned about recently from some of my Facebook friends. This site is one source that can help you evaluate the ideological perspectives of different news platforms. The rating you see here are for the, for the news media listed in the same order. They're rated on their points of view as well as on how factual they are. Breitbart at the top is one of the most conservative platforms, and it, its factuality is rated as mixed. The New York Times is rated to be slightly left of center, but highly factual. <clears throat> when I was teaching in Kuala Lumpur in 2017, my students and I visited the newsroom of Malaysia Kinney. Media Vias Fact Check rates Malaysia Kinney as slightly further left than the New York Times, and Malaysia Kinney gets a mixed rating for factual reporting. My dictionary says that the word media can be considered either singular or plural, but I believe plural is more descriptive of the facts. There are many news media. Every organization is different. They are not all the same. Next. So I would say the most important thing about a news organization is how reliably it gives you the facts. Discerning news consumers rely on media that are fact-based, whether they are liberal or conservative. If a news organization agrees with you on most issues, but is not fact-based, it's not very helpful for you to know the truth. Next. One sign of a news organization's credibility is where it publishes corrections. Here you see uh, the Associated Press corrections policy from its style book. I underlined a couple of sentences. The AP says that when we're wrong, we must say so as soon as possible. A correction must always be labeled a correction. We do not use euphemisms. You say, well, wait a minute. A correction means that something 
previously published was wrong. So why would you believe a news organization that has been wrong? <clears throat> well, they all get it wrong from time to time. They produce news in a hurry, complete and good information, may be hard to find. And sources may lie to the media or withhold information. A good information will admit its mistakes and correct them. Next. The New York Times runs corrections regularly. They even correct errors that you might consider minor, which is what I would consider minor here. Uh, this, in this case, the Times had given the wrong proper name for a company, mistakenly inserting the word dance. Notice what it says about corrections made during the press run. I've worked in several newspaper newsrooms, and when the press started rolling, we passed copies around the newsroom and asked everyone to look for mistakes. When we found a mistake, we would stop the press and correct it. Sometimes we even threw away the papers that had already been printed. If a news organization never corrects itself, that's one less reason to trust what it says. Next. <clears throat> a dictionary defines satire as the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues. If it's satire, it's intended to be funny or to make a point, but it probably is not true. On the left here, you see an ongoing satire feature from the, the New Yorker magazine. You can tell it's not true because it says, not the news. Satire should be clearly labeled, but sometimes it's not, and you have to search a website to find a description of its content. This one comes from bustatroll.org. A, a friend posted a Bustatroll story as if it were true on Facebook, so I looked it up. I looked up what Bustatroll says about itself, and it says that everything on this website is fiction. If you believe that it is real, you should have your head examined. Next. Journalism is a profession that has high standards, but these standards are not enforced by law in a free country such as the United States because enforcement would allow the government to control content. Another clue to whether something may be false is whether it's carelessly presented. Bad editing, grammar, and spelling tell you what the writer or editor did not know or what she was doing. They tell you the writer or editor did not know what she was doing or did not pay attention to details. Even a bad speller can use a spell check feature on a computer. If they didn't bother to check the spelling, do you really think they checked the facts diligently? Next. These are the... Uh, Ethical Standards of the Society of Professional Journalists, which is a, an organization of about 6,000 members in the United States. A lot of other journalists uh, are not members, but they subscribe to this code of ethics or similar codes. These are only the subject headings in the SPJ code. You can find the details at spj.org. Next. The Public Relations Society of America has about 30,000 professional and student members. And um, this is its code of ethics. You can see it's similar to SPJs in many ways. Even though PR people are influencers, the good PR people try their best to be honest and fair. The details of this code of ethics are at prsa.org. You can rely more on information from people and organizations that adhere to ethical standards. I can see that you're, uh, you can't see th uh, three of, or two actually of PRSA's ethical standards. After independence, they have loyalty and fairness. Next. These examples are so wrong, they're funny. They don't come from news stories, but from the many from other uh, uh, signs and so forth people have put up. And the many mistakes give us reason to question the intelligence and reliability of the writers. The misspelled words include liberty, tyranny, exceptions, morons, afraid, and China, which should have a capital C. The phrase American-made needs a hyphen. You need commas after stuff in America. 
the space before the period should be deleted. Whose needs an apostrophe? The period after this should be a question mark. The person who made the post, right, who made this post, uh, even bragged about it in the comments at the bottom. He says he had a brain moment, so I texted it. I'm not sure what kind of brain moment he had, but it wasn't uh, the kind that actually uh, indicated that his brain is functioning very well. I might add that the tone, who's afraid to post this, is an appeal to emotion, not logic. I would not recommend posting or sharing this meme because it's so shoddy, whether or not you agree with the sentiment. Next. <clears throat> All of us benefit from serious journalism, but we have to seek it out and support it. You really do get what you pay for. And the free information on the Internet sometimes is worth exactly what you paid for it. Uh, good information before the Internet was not always free, and it was supported by advertising. Some news media don't have, have not been able to get good advertising support, but they are good news media. So we readers need to consider paying for good journalism. When they ask you to buy a subscription, consider doing so. They need the money in order to serve you. Next. In a free society, there's nobody out there filtering the information that's offered to you. So you have to be a discerning reader. Test the news for truth and believability before you accept it. I just mentioned several criteria that you can use. I want to say something specific about headlines or titles. I'm talking about the large print at the top of a story. A headline is powerful because it's the only thing that people read in many cases as they scan for information. But not all headlines are accurate, complete, or ethical. Some headlines are just clickbait. Their main purpose is to get you to click on the story or share it. But if you read only the headline, you will not get the whole story. You need to read or at least scan the story before you make a judgment, and certainly before you share the story. Next. We should do what we can to share with other people information that's reliable and also how to get reliable information. On occasion, we may be able to refute specific instances of fake news. I would be careful about that. Don't be a jerk. Uh, you're not going to be very effective at persuading somebody if you don't get consider their own feelings and experiences. But uh, uh, do correct fake news when you can. Somebody suggested putting a bold red X across it and then share the screenshot and give the evidence that it's not true. And if somebody corrects fake news that you have mistakenly shared, don't be offended. The best thing to say is thank you. Next. Let's look a little closer at how purveyors of fake news make money. You don't usually pay to read fake news, but advertisers pay when you see the fake news or when you share it or click on it. They make money from uh, self-service technology of companies such as Google and Facebook. And um, these companies don't always have much incentive to screen out fake news. Next. This is Google's AdSense website. Google pitches the service to legitimate businesses and it can make money for a lot of deserving people, maybe even for you. But fake news sites can use it too. If you want to see details, you can go to adsense.com. Don't encourage fake news people any more than you have to. Fake news gains credibility when you share it with someone else. So um, avoid unnecessary clicks on memes and stories and ads. Don't share them. And you can even complain to advertisers and uh, businesses that are supporting fake news. Next. The list of criteria. Next slide, please. The list of criteria that I've given you here is based on this article that I wrote for Troy University in 2016. And you can see the URL there that you can use if you'd like to take a closer look at that article. Next. 
In conclusion, I want to add, I want to use another quotation, but you'll notice that I've been more careful in my attribution. I'm not absolutely sure Pat Moynihan was the original person who said this. I believe he did say it, but it's good advice. Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. Before you go off half cocked, be sure of your facts. Next. Every few weeks, the New York Times used to publish a critique of its own work called Winners and Sinners. And there was a section that, uh, that was headlined, you could look it up. It cited examples where reporters had jumped to conclusions without looking up facts, and consequently had written stories that they were not completely true. To be fair to them, back then, before the internet, looking stuff up could be quite an ordeal. Not anymore, really. You can check most facts by using Google or a similar search engine, and it usually takes a negligible amount of time. So just don't do it. Just do it. Just look it up. Don't guess. Next. Here's my contact information in case I can be of help to you. Next. I think that's the conclusion. I appreciate your attention. I'll be glad to take any questions that you might have. All right. Thank you, Steve, uh, for the wonderful session. I think all of us has benefited from this webinar. So without further ado, let's move to the question and answer session. And to those of you who are currently watching with us, do type your questions in the comment section below. So we will do our best to answer all your questions. OK, let's see. Uh, from the audience, if we have questions. <clears throat> Question is, how is the U.S. government tackling the issue of fake news? Well, uh, government officials don't like fake news when it reflects unfavorably on them. They uh, don't seem to worry about it. Some of them don't seem to worry about it if it helps them. Uh, but uh, in the United States, uh, there's not much uh, opportunity for the government to try to regulate what people publish. We have the First Amendment to the Constitution, which I quoted earlier, that uh, provides for freedom of press and freedom of speech and expression. Uh, we have legislation that uh, protects freedom of expression on the Internet in particular. Sites like Facebook and Twitter are considered to be neutral platforms they are not expected to regulate their users. Any effort to regulate them would probably come across, uh, come up against First Amendment objections. So it's not clear that the government is going to be able to regulate fake news. Uh, so the best regulation is through the free market, the market of ideas. The best solution for bad information is good information. Okay, thank you, Steve. So can we move to the next question from the audience? We have time for actually at least one more question. Okay, from Jay Wong. How media plays a role in stopping the spread of fake news? <clears throat> well, they do it by, by telling the truth, by uh, being careful that they don't unwittingly uh, broadcast fake news by not being careful enough and making mistakes and by correcting mistakes. And they do it uh, by checking each other, by competition in the media. If Fox News uh, says something that CNN uh, thinks to be uh, untrue, CNN is Fox's competition, so they're likely to uh, point out what the truth is. Uh, and also you have the uh, fact-checking sites that I mentioned, some of which are connected with mainstream news media, such as uh, PolitiFact with the Tampa Bay Times in Florida. So I would say the main way that the media can contribute to stopping the spread of fake news is to tell the truth. All right, I think, okay, I think that's the last um, of our questions for today. And uh, on behalf of all our participants, I'd like to thank uh, Steve, uh, for your sharing today. That was very beneficial. That was very wonderful. Okay. All right. So thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Okay. So to everyone else, if you do if you do not want to miss any of our upcoming sessions, okay, you can also subscribe with us by joining our Telegram group. Please scan or go to the link now to join the group. You can also find the link in the description below. So before we end today's session, as promised, a certificate will be issued to the participants. Please go to this link and fill in your details. The certificate will shall be sent to you via email within 30 days from now. To many, to my of colleague, to my colleagues in SAGI, you can also go into the same link for your certificate. So you have uh, 30 minutes to actually uh, fill in your details for the certificate. So hurry up. Okay, so we have come to an end of today's session and on behalf of SEGI Group of Colleges, I thank all of you uh, for joining our SEGI Evening School session for today. So stay connected, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.